Hey guys, Dan Barry here and welcome to another episode of the podcast. And for the next couple of episodes, we're going to do a special series on business value maximization. Look, most business owners are flat out broke and it's the top 4% of business owners make 80% plus of the profits. So these next couple of episodes are taken from an event that was full of business owners that were at least seven-figure revenues trying to scale to seven-figure profits, that that, they're striving to get the most out of their business. And we've broken it up into a few separate parts. It's about how you can maximize the value of your business. So here's what it's not. It's not another sales and marketing video series series that that, that a lot of uh, other business gurus talk about. It's about long-term substantial growth. And in it, you're going to find multiple real world of examples of businesses just like you, clients that have advised uh, that have rapidly grown the value of their business by finding the hidden assets and leverage points that already exist and how to exploit them and maximize them. In this first part, I, I explain my experience on how it's easier to run a business earning five million a year than a business earning 500,000 a year. And I also talk about how one bad year could end up costing you millions of pounds in the long run due to the compound effect. I think it's easier to run a business at five million pounds than it is at half a million. I think the difficult part is getting there. It's figuring out the transition. So in this session, we're going to go through five different examples two of businesses i've advised excuse me to, uh, two businesses that i've advised two that i've owned outright and one that i was in between i was an advisor and then i became a shareholder in that business and they are all they're in different industries and they're using different strategies however i want you to keep asking yourself this uh, these two questions repeatedly where's the hidden asset or excuse me what's the hidden asset and where's the leverage where's the leverage point what's the hidden asset in this business because you can hear from businesses that were not performing and suddenly perform much better and I'm going to tell each of these as a story and whilst I'll point it out at the end equal I want you to think out what What's the asset here? What's the hidden asset which will allow this company to perform much better? And then where's the leverage point? What was the first point you made? Something about five million? It's easier to run a company at five million than it is at half a million in revenue. And the reason why, uh, I'm not saying everybody that's done both would agree with me, but that's my experience. And the reason why is typically if you transition to get up to five million in revenue, you've created the infrastructure. You've got more capital at your disposal, you've got more people at your disposal, you've got, you, 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 you hopefully, uh, in my case it wasn't an instant overnight meteoric rise to frame, you've built up the infrastructure which makes the business more stable and more robust. But the difficult bit is the transition. How do you get the infrastructure when you don't have the resources? Right, especially when the infrastructure in a lot of cases is made up of people, which costs money. So that, that that's what we're gonna, um, that's what we're going to address. Think about it this way. If you had a business, uh, and I'll keep the math very simple just to illustrate the point. If you've got a business that's got 500,000 top line revenue, okay? And let's say on that 500,000, you're making 100,000 in profit. Obviously, the margins vary radically by industry, okay? But let's say that's where you're at today. And you're wanting to grow. And let's say you're end point or your end point for your vision as you see it now is being at 5 million and you figure on 5 million you are going to have 1 million of EBIT profit before tax okay let's just say that's your end point and at that point you might be choosing to exit um, or you might be choosing to say no no I've, I've now got the MD I've got the management in place the business can I can remove myself entirely from the business and there'll be some examples of that in the case studies that I'm about to give you Here's, here's why coming to trainings like this is, to my mind, beyond paramount. It's critical. Because what do most business owners do? Most business owners try and grow, and what happens? 
either nothing, very little, or in a lot of cases, what happens when businesses try to grow? Over, over trading, go they, bust. they go bust. More businesses go broke trying to grow than just trying to maintain the status quo. Right? It's not exactly a positive spin, Tom, in a, in a business growth seminar, but I think you need to be aware of the downside risks. But equally, if, let's say, this was going to take you five years to go from 500,000 to 5 million, let's say you're one of the lucky few that was capable and, uh, and able to do that over five years. But let's say you make a variety of false starts. So in an early session before lunch, Rob mentioned he built up a little bit of cash, tried to expand, put on extra vans, and lost it. But then he came back later, having made some changes, and made it work, and then added, was able to add a four, fifth, sixth van. Okay? But let's just replace vans for years in business. If you lose a year okay, on this model, so let's say that the businesses went in straight lines, revenue and profit over five years, went in straight lines. If you screw up in year one, how much, and you lose all the profit, right? And profit and cash aren't the same thing, but let's pretend it is for a second. So in Rob's case, he lost that 30,000 pounds. How much did it cost Rob to make that mistake under the assumption it's setting back a year? How much money did he lose? 30 grand plus a year's worth of trading. So he lost 30 grand, yes, plus a year's worth of trading, but what, so what did that year's loss trading? Of uh, years of loss of trading cost him. I'm going to tell you right now, it didn't cost him metaphorically here the hundred thousand. It cost him the million because if you start trading a year later, he still has to do year one again next year. Yeah. Right? It, it, it builds upon itself. So it, he failed to to get the third van going. He eventually figured that out, but time has passed. He still had to get the third van. He didn't get to jump straight to four vans. So therefore, it costs you the last year's revenue before you exit. Which, if you're exiting, but now your profit's only 750,000, all right, you, you, you've lost uh, a million EBIT because you've missed that last year's trading, but then your exit valuation is going to be based on a profit of 750, not on the profit of a million. So it's going to cost you a multiple of the 250. So it probably cost you another million, let's say, if you're on a four times multiple. So I think there is very, uh, it's paramount not to reinvent the, the wheel. The advantage of learning from other business owners, Alfred, is it gives you quicker speed to solution. It allows you not to make the mistakes. Warren Buffett, 101, uh, the guy that's been amongst the richest people on the planet for the last 30 years, I think there's a lot to learn from him. And he says when it comes to investing, and he describes the stock market as you're just investing in businesses, Okay, you're buying a, a slice of a business when you buy shares. He goes, when it comes to investing, there are only two rules. Rule number one, don't lose money. Rule number two, refer to rule number one. <laughs> and, and the point is, if you're a smart switched on business owner, you're going to come up with some great ideas that will work, that will allow your business to progress. Okay? Every, the fact that you're in this room means that you've got some of those. The problem is, we also come up with some bad ideas, which end up costing us a lot of money. And then the compound effect means it doesn't cost us the hundred grand, it costs us the million. <clears throat> Said a different way, if you could rewind the clock five years and you could change any three key financial decisions that you've made, if you could rewind the clock and undo three financial decisions, commitments that you've made, who would have a hell of a lot more money than they do right now? Show of hands. Okay? Look around the room. So I'm in favor of coming up with great ideas that allow you to progress faster, but I'm even more in favor of not doing stupid stuff. Right? And sometimes it's, it's just getting the fundamentals right, the meeting rhythm, the, the culture so that somebody doesn't take you to a tribunal. Somebody uh, else in this room told me over the lunch break that they had... Uh, uh, a disgruntled employee steal the database and go to set up in competition and then it ended up settling out of court which meant the, the person in this room had to pay them money to make it go away even though they were the one that was screwed over and I'm certain that they're not the only person in this room hands down but 
what are the fundamental shifts that allow you not to make the mistake that's costing you the big money later? That's what this, that's what this presentation is about. That was part one. In the next segment, I talk about how to value your business. No, but let's just think about it this way. If I was in your <laughs> shoes, okay, when I advise a business, for all the people in our mastermind program, so whether it's Alex, whether it's Rob, whether it's Stephen Becky, who you're hearing from later, or any of the case studies um, uh, that you're gonna hear about now, I'll look at that business and I'll go, okay, let me pretend I own this. Okay, let me pretend I own this. How would I maximize the value of this company? Either have it make more money, or more reliably, predictably, and sustainably over the long term. So it's less dependent upon me, but more than that. So it doesn't have the massive highs and lows. I don't know about you, but good God, I'm, I feel like I'm getting too old for that. I want to have, I want to have consistent, steady progress in the right direction. I'm not up for making a million one year and then losing it the next. I, I don't need that drama. And I would suggest um, uh, drama and profits are inversely proportional. Uh, a way a mentor said it to me is, the problem with drama is, it only gets solved when you write a check. And I think there's a lot of truth in that. Whether it be an employee issue, and you have to, or a legal issue you have to settle out of court, whether it be, oh my God, a supplier screwed up, and you have to pay extra costs for supplies, you have to rush job, you have to redo a job. It all costs money. But worse, it costs you headspace. Which, uh, well, yes, but the, the time is really the focus, which means you're not progressing the business strategically, which means it doesn't grow forward at all, okay? So, basic uh, sentiment, but I'm going to refer back to it a few times. So, if we're talking about how, uh, how you value a company, how do you establish a company's value? The value of the company equals what? How do you establish a company's, might you establish a company's value? how much it's worth if it was being sold. Okay, so one factor would be its profit. I.e. that's what pays a return to the shareholders. So you might look at its trading history to say how profitable is this enterprise? Okay, because that's a way of su suggesting, well, if it continued in this vein, I put X in, I'm gonna get a Y return on my investment. Okay, good. There's another half of this equation. What is it? It's a, it's, a, it's a multiple. So if you look in the stock market, there's a formula that's been around 50 plus years called a PE ratio. Okay? And what that means is it's the price of the company, or the company's shares, divided by the earnings. Right? So if, to be simplistic, if a company's got um, uh, a million pound valuation, and it's got 100,000 pounds in profit, it's got a PE ratio of 10 to one, right? Which said a different way is you're getting a 10% return on your money, right? If it was still only valued at a million pounds on the stock market, not that you'd be valued that low on the stock market, but you get the point, and it was making 200,000 pounds in profit, the ratio would just be five to one. In other words, that's a 20% return on your money. Now, most people don't think about the business that way, right? But profit, is simple. Simple, not necessarily easy, but it's simple. There's only two ways to drive profit. What are those two ways? Increasing income, lower costs. Yeah, you, you can increase revenue, sales, turnover, you can have that number go up, or you can decrease expenses, okay? As a ratio of the sales. So if a business wants to improve its efficiency, you can either increase um, it's sales, full stop, because if the ratio stays the same, you still make more profit. Or you can decrease the expenses as a ratio of the, the revenue burned. Okay? So we're going to talk about a whole host of factors that relate to that and strategies for growth. Uh, but that's where most business owners spend most of their time. I'm going to tell you, if you want to have a, a much easier life, you should put more focus on this side of the equation. See, if I pulled up the stock market app now on my phone and we looked at Apple or we looked at Google or we looked at Amazon, they'd all have PE ratios. It's a, it's a standard ratio, okay? Um, it, it, what does that ratio represent? What it represents is the reliability, predictability, and sustainability of those profits. Okay, so, uh, for example, because we've got a few fitness businesses in the room, 
is typically there's a there's a range by sector. In the same way, if you're looking at a two bedroom house within a few miles of this location, you're going to have a certain range of valuation. Okay, it might be two hundred to two hundred fifty thousand. Actually, don't know if I'm there, but but let's just say it's that. It, depending what dictates whether you're you're at the lower end of the range or the higher end of the range. Well, the specific street, the condition of the property, and it's the same thing with businesses. So a lot of small fitness businesses, small, so kind of uh, sub seven figures revenue, uh, typically going to have a, a, a multiple that could go from two at the low end to five. Okay, that would be a typical range. But if you've got profits of 100,000, that means your company is likely to be valued somewhere between 200,000 and 500,000, okay? which is a massive range, even though the profit's the same. What's going to allow your company to get a half a million pound valuation rather than a 200,000 pound valuation? It's going to be a lot of factors, but it's how reliable, predictable, and sustainable it is, uh, 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 that profit. And fundamentally, it's going to boil down to two things. It's going to boil down to how quickly your company's growing. Because if a company is growing year on year, you may not know why, but it's going to be worth more than a company that's not been growing because underneath it all, there is something making that company grow. You could be in, a right, in the right sub-niche, you could have a great geography, you could have an amazing management team, doesn't matter. The fact is the company is steadily progressing, makes it worth more than a company that's flatlining or decreasing. Does that make sense? Even though at the point of valuation, they've both got £100,000 value. But this, this box is the big one. And this is the one that I overlooked for many years to my great peril, as you're about to, as you're about to hear. And that is, the multiple will be adjusted downwards for risk. It'll be adjusted downwards for, for, for risk. And a different way of thinking about risk is, what are the single points of failure? Dependency of the owner on the business. And one of those uh, is pro highly probably going to be the dependency upon you, the owner. So the irony is, if the business is dependent upon you, it's higher risk because something could happen to you. You know, uh, uh, I mean, does anybody in here show up at work 10 out of 10 in performance standards every single day? Just me? No, no. Uh, so, no we, we, uh, we don't, but, but you've got distractions, you've got kids, you've got health issues, you've got uh, family issues, you've got marital issues, you've got whatever going on. Okay, and if something happens to you, uh, for, for most people, that means their business is in deep trouble. But that also inhibits the growth. <coughs> Because you are the company's biggest asset in all probability, but you are also its choke point. So that's why if you get the infrastructure right, all of a sudden you, you can do something like Rob did or like Alexis uh, uh, did. I don't know over the, the, the last year or two, but I, I think over the last two years, I could be slightly off on this. You know where his profit level is now and he was lost making four years ago when we started working together. But... Um, over a narrower range than that, his profit went up 22x. It went from, um, uh, you know, low, you know, he's making a good living, but that's it. So all of a sudden, being like, oh my God, there's loads of money now. He hit critical mass. So uh, as a curve, it kind of looks like that for Bob, for Alexis, uh, and you're going to hear it more throughout today as well. So you've got to say to yourself, how do I de risk this business? We're going to talk about the profit side, but how do I de-risk this business? Because in doing so, typically you make it more stable, which means that there's less cock-ups. There's less potholes which cost the money, which means the compounding happens quicker, which means invariably they seem like they're opposing risk and growth and they're very much entwined. My experience is if you de-risk the business, typically growth happens much more quickly. The problem is when business owners are on this slow growth bit, they get twitchy and then they do something stupid and they metaphorically speaking shoot themselves in the foot. Right? So, so that's what this whole conversation is about. How do we drive the value of your business? So metaphorically, insert your own numbers here and then I'm going to get, get, get on with the case studies. Let's say at the moment, 
or in the previous financial year, your profits were 100,000. We've got businesses in here uh, uh, that are six-figure revenues, businesses here that are seven-figure revenues, businesses that are losing money, businesses that are making great money. But whatever that number is for you, okay? So let's say it's 100,000. And let's say, do you have a multiple? If you've looked at competitors who have sold, you might have a feel for this. If you don't, as a proxy for now, just take the average from last year for small cap businesses that sold in the UK. The average was just below three. It's like 2.97 or something. So um, it's not about what the value is. It's about the process we're gonna go through now. It's about how do we drive up the value. So in this case, this imaginary business, 100,000 times by three would give us a valuation of 300,000. Your job, I believe, as the owner of this company or the, the prime director in this company is to drive the company's value by simultaneously increasing profitability but also driving the multiple by doing it more reliably, predictably and sustainably. I'm going to give you case studies now and I'll, I'll draw out some of how I do this but some of it you'll just need to infer it. That's why you've got to ask yourself the two questions. What's the hidden asset and where's the leverage point? you're going to see a lot of examples of where this happens, but you're also going to hear some mistakes that cost very large amounts of money as well. It's all about how do we accomplish this, and it can come on either side, uh, <laughs> either side of this equation. Does that make sense? Okay. So, I think that you want to go, hey, great, a, a, a goal, if you're setting a goal for yourself, I'm in favour of setting profit goals, not revenue goals, but I'm in, I'm in favour of setting business value goals far more than I am for profit goals because if you had a choice that you could double this profit but it's risky as all hell and your business is likely 50-50 going to go broke next year over trading or it can stay exactly the same but the business is enti becomes entirely non-dependent upon you and it's rock solid like an earthquake could happen and the profits are going to stay stable for the next 10 years, which would you rather have? Now, it's a personal choice, but if it, if it were me, great. I'm gonna take a more stable, reliable business every time, especially when you consider when it's that stable and robust and predictable and reliable, actually growth becomes a hell of a lot more easy because your cash flow is more predictable, etc., etc., etc. okay? So, how do we drive business value is the name of the game. In the final segment for today, I share a story from a client that was able to completely remove himself from daily operations and how he managed to do it. At the previous version of um, uh, this event, which was a few months ago, there was a guy called Paul Goff. Okay, some of you might have seen his videos or he's been on my podcast. And Paul was a physiotherapist. And when Paul started out, he was a solopreneur. So he would literally do the, do the work, he would get the clients, and that was it. And then he got to a point where he was seeing 50, 60, 70 clients a week. He got to the point where his, his from doing the massages, that his, uh, the joints and his thumbs became so painful, he couldn't text on a mobile phone. And then he had a health scare, where he got taken into hospital, suspected heart, uh, heart attack, I believe, if I recall correctly. It wasn't, fortunately, but he'd had, whether it was an anxiety attack or he'd had some kind of scare. And he went, holy crap, like, I'm saying I've got a physiotherapy business. I don't. I've got a job. What am I going to do about this? Now, fortunately for Paul, he was uh, at an advantage versus most small business owners in that he was fiscally conservative. So he'd made money doing it, and he kind of set a lot of it to, to one side. And he gradually and systemically, over, over a couple of years, removed himself and hired the people to replace him. So in the first year, his profit went down because now he's got somebody doing the work, okay? But he's instantly freed himself up. And because he had enough cash on hand on the side, he was able to set up another location. So then over time, fast forward a few years, he went from one location to four locations. And he went from it all being dependent upon him to not being dependent upon him at all. And uh, on this one, I'm going to be slightly ambiguous in numbers because for the physio part, he's asked me to be non-specific. But all I'll say is he's uh, making six-figure profit. 
He's got four locations, so it's much more stable. Okay? He owns some of the buildings in which the physiotherapy practice exists, so that's another investment which he could rent out and the property will go up over time as well. Um, uh, and the key for him was being really systematic. It was really thinking about, hey, great, where's the hidden asset? So in the first instance, the hidden asset for him was he was very good at thinking, well, what's the system? He would admit, I'm not the best physiotherapist in the country. It's not the product that makes me the best. The fact that I'm making more than the uh, average physio by far and away is because I got very good at thinking through the process of how do I attract leads? How do I then convert those leads? How do we book the follow on? And how do we make the, the, the clinic run efficiently? That was the hidden asset. So he went, well, why does it make sense for me to be in the business? It doesn't. It, do, it didn't mean he needed to invest in the short term, which made him less profitable. Something most business owners are either unwilling to do or unable because they stretch themselves so uh, tightly financially. <clears throat> but then once he got over that hump, he got location two, three, and four, stable, profitable. However, okay, um, uh, so the hidden asset was the systemization. The leverage point in that business was hiring the first clinic manager or operations manager. However, that's just the beginning of this curve. What he's done in the last 18 months or so is he's, he, he then uh, took another hidden asset and he's turned it into a business that's making seven figure profit this year, okay? And the, what he did was he went, well, what's the actual asset? I've got all these systems, great. I can set up more clinics myself. He got advice. He, he went to a lot of different uh, mentors, including me, and said, what should I do? And some of the advice was going, great, buy other, other physiotherapy practices. Repeat the same process. Each one's making money. You have more making money. You've got property portfolio as well. This is great. But Paul, within the systems, felt that he excelled in both the marketing and he also recognized wherever he went to physiotherapy conferences and things like that, he, he loved especially going to the US. The way he'd gotten good at the marketing was he went to, to business growth conferences and he'd gone to a few in the US. And he found it interesting whenever he went to a physiotherapy conference in the US, um, they were amazed that Paul could make any money. Because in the US, it's all, uh, it, it's all paid for. There's no NHS. So Paul's kind of success story of making money, and all of a sudden he, he was this stranger in a foreign land. And he would get flooded by people at these conferences saying, how do you do this? And then he suddenly realized, there's a hidden asset here. I've got all these people, my peers, that want to know how I did it. How can I monetize this? So he then started teaching in the US, seminars, trainings, workshops, to the PT profession, how he built up his successful multi-clinic practice in the UK. So he had a business which he'd freed himself from, which made money that was systematic. So the multiple went up and it was profitable and solid and stable. And that gave him the time and the money with which to pursue the, the real uh, opportunity, which for him was he went, there's a whole market in the US. I love going to the US. I can teach him all this stuff. And it took off wildfire because he was freed up. And that meant that, even though he had to invest in a whole host of different things, he had to set up a US company, he had to have all kinds of legal fees, he's now a US uh, uh, resident, so he's got a visa, and all that cost a lot of money, but the fact was, the core business was stable, covered everything, but then he had enough reserves to allow him to build and grow, and then it took off. And now, so he's got a business which is extremely high margin, making seven-figure profits. So the two questions were, what's the hidden asset? And the answer in his physio business was it was the systems. He figured out how to make it really clear so he could, he's, he's based in the, or the physio practice or in the northeast of England. He could take people on very low wages, and, but he could have it so systemized that it was easy to get people trained up. So his staff costs, relatively speaking, are very low and it worked well. And what was the leverage point? The leverage point was documenting the system so he could hire a clinic manager to run the clinic. And then he just repeated it in multiple locations. That was in business one. But then what that really did was 
gave, uh, uh, allowed him the opportunity to go after business number two. What was the asset? It was all the skills that he, he had in marketing, especially in, in the US, because he could say, hey, I've got a cash paying practice in a country that has free national health care, which the Americans went crazy for. So they all wanted to buy it and he just sold what they want in, a, in an environment that was non-competitive to him. And, the, and that was the leverage point, this untapped market. And all of a sudden that business exploded and has got seven figure profits. If you like what you've heard so far, you want to find out more about our upcoming skills training session on business value maximization coming up later this month. And if you want to find out about that special day, diving into this stuff in depth, you need to email Gabriella at danbradbury.com. She'll give you the dates, the prices, and if there are any places left available. So contact Gabriella at danbradbury.com for more information about the upcoming business value maximization day. I hope you enjoyed that episode. Three things you need to do now. Number one, make sure you subscribe to this podcast so you do not miss an episode. Also, get on over to Amazon to get a copy of my latest book, Turnover is Vanity, Profit is Sanity, Nine and a Half Steps to Improving Your Profits and Cash Flow. Also, join our Facebook group, the Turnover is Vanity, Profit is Sanity community to connect with other business owners.